Konisti, how are ye? Welcome to episode 11 of the Candlelit Tales podcast. My name is Aaron Hegarty and I'm here with my sister. I'm Sarika Hegarty and the two of us founded Candlelit Tales eh, about, what, four years ago, four and a half? Give or take, let's not get into numbers. We started Candlelit Tales by just the idea of telling stories, really, the oral tradition. I grew up listening to her telling me stories and we decided to tell old Irish stories together and we amassed a group of people who wanted to do that with us. With live performances, with music backing us, we've grown and we keep on growing to tell stories further and further afield. So if you'd like to help support us, because we did start off in a donations based idea, uh, you can help support us online now on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. If you want to keep the oral tradition of storytelling going, you know, that would help. <laughs> Every little helps. Now, today... Wait, is that a slogan? I... We, keeper lit, is, that's ours. Keeper candle lit, <laughs> that's our slogan. Is it a slogan or a logo or a catchphrase or a... You know, it's um, one of those things. Anyway, you're here to listen to a story and I'm here to ask my sister to tell me a story. And this is a very... Well, this is the end of a cycle of stories. This is the Sons of Mill. So take her away, Surga. All right. The Sons of Mill. In a land far from here, on the northern tip of the Iberian Peninsula, there lived a man named Ith Espana. Ith was a great man. In his youth, and he raised his son Mill to maturity, and as he saw his son Mill begin to raise his sons and daughters to adulthood, Ith found himself, more and more, withdrawing from the world and spending his time in quiet reflection. His favourite place for this was in the upper rooms of a tower, with the windows facing to the north and to the east, where he became convinced that he could see an island far off on the horizon, often hidden by clouds. Ith would tell people about this island and try and point it out to them, but more often than not there was nothing to be seen, and so, because they didn't like to disagree with so venerable a man, the people would nod and smile politely and leave as soon as possible. But Ith was convinced. He was sure that this island was out there somewhere, and he was sure as well that it was calling to him in some way that he didn't understand, that his destiny was there, that this was a place that he had to go. And so, Ith gathered together a small group of servants and followers, and they manned a boat, and they set off on the long voyage to this strange place that might not even be a place. The journey was long and the journey was hard, but Ith was delighted his spirit soared because the closer they got to this island, the clearer that Ith could see that it was a real place and that he had been right and that his dreams, although he had been dreaming, were coming true. And they landed on this island and it was more wonderful than Ith could even have imagined in his wildest dreams. This was a place of beauty and bounty, a place of prosperity. The people warm and welcoming and beautiful. The land so prosperous, so lush, so full, and everywhere peace and prosperity. And as they travelled through this land they were welcomed wherever they went. For the two of the honoured their elders, until at last they came, inevitably, to the middle, to a place called Tara, where the High Kings ruled. Now at this time there was not one High King, but three. Makul, Makkecht, and Makgrania, the three sons of Kermit, who was himself the son of the Dagda, and they divided the ruling of Ireland between the three of them, but they were never easy in it. There was always a quarrel between them, and the quarrel was ever the way they would divide the riches and treasures they'd gotten from their father's inheritance. And when Ith saw this, he was taken aback. 
It seemed to him an odd thing to quarrel over in a land so bountiful and prosperous as they had, but politeness forbade him from saying so. The kings of the Tuatha invited Ith to a feast. They feasted him, they wined him, they dined him, and then they thought, well, since they had this old wise man here among them, who was a stranger to all of them and therefore impartial, they might as well ask him how to settle the quarrel that was between them. And the only answer that Ith could give was to say, well, you must look to your own customs, lads. You must look to your own laws, because this land that you have is incredible. I don't know if you know this, but I've been places, and I've seen things, and I've lived a long, long time, and this country of yours is amazing. And he spoke and he spoke on and he spoke in such glowing terms of the place that he had seen that McCool and McKecht and McGrania started to look sidelong at one another, started to mutter under their breaths to one another. And what they said to one another was, this man is speaking with the tongue of a conqueror. He surely means to go back home and bring an army and take this land for himself. And without any more provocation than that, they put him to death. Ith's companions fled back to sea and they fled back home where they told his son Mill what had happened. And Ith's son, Mill, well, he was a warrior and he was in the height of his power and he gathered all of his armies, all of his sons and all of their armies and in a great fleet that blackened the sea they set sail for Ireland to avenge the death of Ith Espana. Now if the journey that Ith had taken had been hard, the journey of Mill was harder for the storms blew up against them and Mill himself was killed, perished of the hardship of the voyage along with many others. But his sons survived and his eight sons took command, chief among them Amergan the Druid. They landed in a place called Inberslania which they named after Amergan's wife for she too had perished on the journey. And when they landed there, they started to march straight for the seat of the High Kings. Now they had not gone far. They were passing a place called Sleeve Mish, a great mountain, when they encountered a wild woman, a beautiful queen of the forest. And she introduced herself. She said her name was Banba, and she was the wife of MacCool, the son of the Hazelwood. And she told Amergan that she would welcome the sons of Mill to this land as long as they promised to name it after her. And Amergan took one look in her wild eyes and said, absolutely, they would. And so they went on and they came to a hill called Ishnuk, the very navel of Ireland itself. And there they met a queen who was at one moment wide-eyed and beautiful and in the next moment in the blink of an eye they saw before them a hooded crow and she introduced herself. She said her name was Eru and she was the wife of Macgrania, the son of the sun and she said she welcomed them as long as they named this island after her. And Amergin said Absolutely. Now they came to the hill of Tara where the three kings of the Tua de Danon were. And when McCool and McKecht and McGrania saw the armies coming towards them, they knew they were in trouble. They asked then for a truce. They asked Amergan to withdraw his ships over nine waves beyond the border of the island so that they could have time to prepare for nine days to meet this army in battle and to settle matters properly. For you see, the sons of Mill did not just want an Eric. They did not just want a price for the death of Ith Spania. The price they wanted was the rulership of Ireland itself. 
and they would settle for nothing less. Amorgan agreed to these conditions, and he led the sons of Mill back to their ships and back over nine waves, to rest and prepare for the battle. But before the battle was fought, before the nine days were up, the druids of the Tuatidanan sent a great storm raging down against the ships of the Sons of Mill, driving them back and scattering them north and south and east and west, wrecking them against the rocks whenever they came upon them, devastating the fleet of the invaders. Amergan suspected that this was not a natural storm, and so he sent his brother Aranan climbing high up on the mast of the ship and Aranon climbed and he climbed through the storm and the howling wind and the squalling rain until he came to a point where he broke through and saw the sun shining on his face and the warm still air above the storm that was raging below and so he knew that this was a magical storm indeed and in his haste back down the mast to bring the news to Amergen, he slipped, and Arnon fell to his death. But as he fell, he called out the warning, he called out the news to his brother, and Amergen heard. And so Amergen stepped to the prow of the ship then, and called on the waves to calm. And they calmed. And he led the ships of the Sons of Mill to land on Arden's shore, and when they landed, he stepped on first, and he sang. I am the wind on the sea, I am the wave of the sea, I am the bull of seven battles, I am the eagle on the rock, I am a flash from the sun, I am the most beautiful of plants, I am a strong wild boar, I am a salmon in the water, I am a lake in the plain, I am the word of knowledge, I am the head of the spear in battle, I am the god that puts the fire in your head, who who spreads the light in the gathering on the hills? Who can tell the ages of the moon? Who can tell the place where the sun rests? And with those words they landed. Now they had arranged that the battle would take place on a plain called Talchu. And there they gathered. And they saw the armies of the Tuatidanan mustered against them, shining and beautiful and deadly in their grace. And there are those that say that a terrible battle was fought on the plains of Taltu on that day, that the sons of Mel slaughtered the Tuatidanan by their hundreds with their iron weapons, that they killed the three kings in single combat that the three queens who fought alongside their armies were slaughtered also, that they drove the survivors into the sea and that the plains ran red with blood. So say some, and so some believe. But there are others who say. They came to the plain of Taltu, and there before them were arrayed rank on rank the shining ones in all their glory and all their armour, shining and beautiful with faces like the sun and with arms and armour that gleamed in any light. They stood prepared and ready for battle and then as one they turned. They stepped sideways. They entered into the other world. And there they dwell, untroubled, till the end of time. Wow. Well, I love that image. They're all there in the plains and they just step through the veil. Yeah. It's beautiful. And that's why 
the two I did Annan are still in Ireland. Oh yeah. That wasn't the end of them like. No. And this is like the thing with the two I did Annan. They they never leave Irish culture and the Irish psyche. Hmm. Like it was one of the fun things um, about the kind of integration of, of Christianity into Ireland. There's the story of how the angels fell and became demons, like led by Lucifer, rebelling against God. And what the Irish people decided was, okay, in that great battle between good and evil, there were some angels who sat it out to see what would happen. And they were banished to earth. And that was the Christian reimagining of who these beings were. But they weren't going to try and tell Irish people that they didn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And they became the fairies and the like the little people and that whole kind of the good people. But like that whole progression of kind of a a, a folklore, you know, that kind of evolved out of this great mythology and then Mm -hmm. the, the more kind of shorter little anecdotal stories and the leaving the, leaving the saucer of milk out and uh, you know making sure you don't go into the fairy fort and these little superstitions that just kind of yeah. led paved the way because you had these beings that could interfere yeah and like that idea that, that what probably was at one time a religious ritual of leaving sacrifice or offering or not stepping on holy ground unless it was a particular time or you were a particular, you know, rank of druid. Just, again, nothing in culture ever really goes away. It just sort of changes and the way people look at it changes. And yeah, they become, they go from being rituals to being superstitions. Hmm. Um, But they don't leave easily. And I guess they can't leave because, you know, if you don't have science, if you don't have a way of explaining everything, you, you, you're constantly looking for an explanation other than you, your, your eyes can give you. And you're constantly mm. surrounded by magic, you know, if you want to see it. That's kind yeah. of the whole idea. If you want to look for, you know, blissful, beautiful, magical moments, then, yeah, it seems yeah. like people do step out of the sunlight and walk <laughs> towards you. And, yeah, that person just vanished. And maybe that kid was stolen away by the fairies because he's demented. Yeah, <laughs> you don't you don't know. And when yeah, like you said, when you don't have a rational explanation for what's going on, um, you you find other explanations. And yeah, it's great. Um, so I was going to say something there and then it went out of my head. It's all right. It's probably the uh, siren that you can probably hear now. There's something going up and down the I, road there I now. don't think people can hear this stuff as much as we can. This I is a very know. sensitive microphone and, and we can hear everything very amplified when we're recording this. You see. But, uh, you know, that's what remastering is for. <laughs> OK, well, if you can hear the siren, that's just because there's something going on. This is uh, because I live in a city. Yeah. You can hear the rain on the roof that's and the sirens in the distance. That's the shafas. It's great. And uh, at the moment... We're experiencing the experiencing the Scaravine, you know, the uh, the cold wind of April that blows in mm-hmm. and tickles you and makes you think it's summer and then hits you with a sickness and yep. hits you with the cold that everybody has right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um so that's that's the Scaravine. That is watch, why you don't out go that. outside without a coat until there's no ore in the month. Shout out to Kira who reminded us of us that. Yeah. Um, and her grandmother. <laughs> um, telling you, them, them old ones, they know what's going on. And grannies knew what the score was. And they kept these stories alive as well. And yeah. I guess the, the the Sons of Mill, they kind of became, the, the, they were the last cycle. But we started off in our podcast and episode, uh, what was it again? I think so it was five. about episode five that we were talking about. Okay, sir. The Kessler first Kessler. woman uh, who landed in Ireland, and mm-hmm. that was the first uh, of the the Lower Gawala, the first the first of the Book of Invasions, and this is the last story of the Book of Invasions. Although so, not the last invasion in Irish history, <laughs> which is kind of funny. We haven't mythologized the other ones yet; they're no. a bit recent. I mean, that that's just where you go straight into history. And, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> we started writing stuff down and we stopped making stuff up. I mean, like the kings of Lachlan and, you know, you, you have all these like Scandinavian names and the kings of Norway and you have them in the myths. You do. And like they're definitely Vikings. Like, sure. <laughs> like Probably. Probably. I mean. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I mean, you, you do get that funny little crossover. There's a whole branch of scholarship in folklore about looking at like where did these stories come from and what mm. the originals are. Um, it's just real hard to figure out. Totally. But these lads anyway, whoever you know, the Sons of Mill were or might have been, they were the last to kind of land here. 
and so they you know essentially you can say uh, after magic time the Celts came and yeah so well these were these were likely the Celts um, you know there's this is the kind of it is getting into sort of semi-historical territory yeah, but totally. there's some interesting stuff about like the landscape of Ireland and the, the way it's laid out there is some evidence that people settled in Ireland go from the west to the east because some of the oldest monuments are actually on the west coast mm-hmm. and there was also you know there's there's kind of conflicting theories about how people got here whether they it, there was a time when you could walk from the continent to what is now England and then on to Ireland and it would seem like that would be the obvious way for people to get here I mean yeah but there's some evidence that that's not how it happened that they actually came up from northern Spain as happens in this story and settled on the west coast and kind of gradually moved inwards class and like the Lower Gawala has all these successive you know waves of invaders and cultures we've looked at two of them now in this podcast mm-hmm. there's another few there's a few there's a good few <laughs> but I guess I, I'm always uh, drawn back to listening to the rain <laughs> No, I'm drawn back to uh, John Moriarty frequently. He was a beautiful poet and, uh, you know, a gorgeous storyteller. And mm-hmm. he, he, was, he was from Kerry, beautiful accent. Actually, Tommy Tiernan interviews him on YouTube if you have no idea who he is. But there's a couple mm. of little lovely nuggets that he leaves in his audiobooks and all the rest of it. And he's beautiful. But his whole kind of way of, of looking at the the old paganism and, and the, the new version of, of people who arrived here was kind of like out with the old and the good and in with the new and the bad and it seemed kind of a bit, bit black and white and y- you, you kind of have a counter argument for that. Well I have like one of the things that I love about Irish mythology I, I think it's also one of the things that makes it quite difficult for people to, to get their heads around it sometimes is that it it is very resistant to black and white thinking to good versus evil thinking which I think is massively ingrained in us today hmm. you know you have stories of the two of Danann and they are all over the place morally <laughs> speaking like you know we're we're going to be looking at the the story of the sons of Turin next week oh, yeah. in which they do not come off great Lou certainly doesn't I would neither do the sons of Terran. No, they don't. You know, like these are people who are who are violent and impulsive and uh, vengeful and spiteful, and like they're not like so. I I I know I personally have a thing about you know keeping that ambiguity there. Like mm-hmm. I like it, I really like it, and the fact that if you go up to Donegal, the the Fomorians are not considered to be evil, even yeah. though they are kind of the adversaries of the two of Danann. I think. What Moriarty saw in the Tua de Danon was this this goddess culture and this matriarchal culture. And he loved that and the idea of that. And the fact that there's a kind of a magic in the Irish landscape that I think he was really connected to yeah. in an incredibly beautiful way. So, like, I massively respect his scholarship, which is a lot more extensive than mine. <laughs> but I also kind of have a little bit of a... I have a little bit of a thing with characterising the two of Dallin as good and the Sons of Mill as bad. Mm-hmm. And I think you see it in the story as well. I mean, Amergan's amazing poem. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah. It's so beautiful. And it also, there's something in this as well about like, again, the madness of Irish mythology. Uh, there's a lovely video on YouTube by a group called The Tale Foundry, if anybody wants to have a look at it, about why Irish mythology isn't more popular. And they actually pick the Amergan story as an example. Because it seems like there's no, that magic is unbounded in Irish myth. Like the two of Danann can't do magic because there's a two of Danann and mortals aren't able to do magic, but they are. It's not like there's no division between it because Amergan is this guy who's not from here, who is 100% human, not one of the shining ones who exists in between this world and the other world. And yet, he's and yet he rocks up to the shore and does this spell poem thing talking about his total unity with the landscape and with everything that is and the land goes sound yeah, yeah, yeah. in you come well like again the kind of the shift of or like the the argument that my art seems to make and, and certainly my brother has made before in interesting conversations I've had with him about a shift of consciousness between like the more 
ingrained into the landscape, the belonging to the land, opposed to the ownership over it. And that seems to be like highlighted by the, the arrival of this next generation, next peoples that came to Ireland. Well, I think the Celtic culture was, was a more patriarchal culture. And there's definitely that, like, obviously you get a new group of people coming and they, they have a shift. <laughs> they bring along a shift. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. And I, I kind of, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but again, I think you're you're skirting into history territory there as well, maybe a little bit. Maybe, yeah. But I mean, you could see, you can read it that way. You can read it either way. Like, that's one of the nice things about ambiguity and why my kind of fight is to keep it open to interpretation. You can interpret Amrigan's verse as being this beautiful transcendental piece where he's just saying I am over yeah. and over again yeah. and it's it's gorgeous and you can interpret the exact same word same words as his being like I am I am in charge of hmm. and that's kind of the up point. to you yeah. and that's the point totally yeah and that's why I like it <laughs> and that's why we're leaving it up to you we're not telling you what we think yeah, uh, exactly. well we're telling we're, you what we think but we're also telling you that your opinion is valid too we're not telling you <laughs> what to think exactly yeah. that's that's yeah I like to think of the Amrigan thing as, as, as that unity of the I am and mm. I think that's kind of the, the way I like to see it as well and I, I like to f- feel that the magic is there and available for all of us and it's it's one of those things that you can slip into and slip out of mm-hmm. and I think you know culturally maybe we lost touch with that a lot uh, in certain places certainly haven't so it's kind of a case of like it, it's as easy to tap into it as it is to tap out and I think that's what I really like about this idea that you know magic is not for special magic people magic is for everybody who can do it and that means that yeah like you said if you can tap out of it you can tap back into it and it's always there go out there and cast a few spells lads well just just walk in the landscape and tap on in exactly all right well our podcast today was produced and edited by Oisín Ryan the legend who also plays the music for the podcast Thank you to everybody in Candle of Tales who's helped us out and for the people who support us and follow us and keep telling us to tell stories because we do love it. We love telling stories. I love listening to stories too. So if you'd like to, you know, give us some feedback on the podcast, we've gotten some very interesting feedback to date and it continues to help us shape this way of telling stories. And if you want to share it, we use the hashtag Candle of Tales podcast on social media. You can also like just email a link to it because we're up on SoundCloud, we're up on our website candlelittales.ie and we'll be in various different platforms as we go. If you'd like to help us get onto various different platforms and get various different things that help us make podcasts, you can be a patron on Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelittales to be a supporter. Email us on info at candletales.ie or find out what we're doing online on candletales.ie. We also do lots of live performances and you can find out all that on our social media, various types of things that you might want to follow. That's probably enough for now. All right. You.